Welcome. Um, welcome to On the Rags. And we are on the rags because we are <laughs> Risa, Amy, Gloria, Flynn. Flynn. and probably because sometimes we're crappy, but oh, we're yeah. on the rags. Yeah. Boy, this oh. week's been a doozy, hasn't Ooh. it? Really doozy. Yeah. My husband. My husband is on the rags, I must say. Yeah. Um, it happens to men, too. It does. It does. Yeah. It does. It's, the, it's when the moon, it's about the moon. I've learned oh, this. Whatever the blood moon. moon that night. It was what? a blood moon. I know. I know. We didn't see it, but I think that's what started his mood. I think he thinks it's a period or something. I don't know, but he's crabby. <laughs> that's what Fred, I used to get Fred clothes with crabs on them. Because I was like, look, it's you. <laughs> and I used to make him, when he was in a mood, I would just go get his little wristband that had an embroidered crab on it. Just throw it at him. Like, here, No, you did that to this. make sure... You did that to make sure he didn't cheat on you with somebody else because they would then think he had crabs. Oh, maybe. Oh, that's, that's a good, good idea. Thinking. That's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Remember <laughs> yeah, that? I don't think. Remember that when you were young and people got crabs? Who would even think like that, Glow? I don't know. I don't I, really know how that happens. I are real are when people get crab. I should. I mean, when people when people get crabs, <laughs> are they real like little? Crabs? I think they are. I never did have it. I have to like admit. crustacean but crabs, like little tiny or little bugs, like that. This is gross. gross. Let's move on. Uh, Let's move on. Uh, I don't even want to think we, about this. We have to Google. But do that. people still get them? I imagine young people. If you're like, I never hear about it. Living at the beach, dirty, <laughs> oh. can't shower enough. Who knows? We just mm. don't. We're not in that world. You're not out. You're not out not. there <laughs> getting yeah. it. So. Oh well. <laughs> so how is everybody? Okay. Well, I felt really sad today because. We have a new grandbaby. I'm a step grandmother, and Michael yeah. is a grandfather. And then I didn't realize this, but it, they had their house fumigated today, so they had to leave. She had to leave. Aaron, his daughter, had to leave with the baby West and their oh. dog. And their dog. So the dog oh. was outside, and I had to leave to come here. And I felt so sad about it until the baby is going through that phase where he screams all the time, <laughs> and I'm like, "Oops, okay, See bye. I have bye. to go. <laughs> Gotta go. Bye." Bye. Sorry, I can't be here to help. <laughs> but that's what I oh. think the the real benefit of being a grandparent is. And here I am. I've never had kids, but my dream was always to adopt like a really smart eighteen year old. <laughs> that's what you know. We have a friend who's on that, scholarship. We have a friend that did that. We have a friend Kelly Slattery who directed. Yeah. Who, who did adopt teenagers because in the foster yeah. system, teenagers have a hard time getting adopted, and she felt that was terrible, and she yeah. adopted two teenagers. She is an angel. Right. I love she that. She's an angel. good work. Because yeah. it is true, those kids are still in foster care, and nobody really, because they want little tiny yeah. babies that they can grow. They are crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Who it's hard. That? Look, all kids are hard, you know? I, I have a friend who's adopted three kids, I think all from the same mom. Wow. And uh, it's hard. Because I was thinking about doing that a few years ago, and he's like, uh, you better think twice. Because it, it is, it's very it, difficult it, in the no beginning. There's no fantasy about it, which I don't have, but yeah, it's hard. It's weird. No, because, just, well, we have a guest that we'll talk about this later. Just yes. keep adopting those animals, and you're fine, Amy. I know. I know. Animals are like babies, aren't they? You have to. Yes, they are. Yeah. You have to get them. Take them out at night, and they wake up in the middle of the night. Oh, and, man. Right? My 13, I have two 13 year old dogs, and one of them right now. It is like rip your guts out. She's coughing all the time, oh. and it's just like it's hard. I wake up five. I mean, she just I shoot straight up in bed when I hear her make that sound, you know. And it's just well, those are your babies. They're my babies. I know animals are. That, I don't care who you're raising. Yeah, it's hard sometimes and wonderful sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yes. Should we talk about rags and what's going on in the world, like in the rags? So oh, must we? Go ahead. I, I, have, mean, I read something this morning. Go ahead. You guys go. But I read something this morning that I want to read to you. Read it. Go ahead. This is terrible, but I'll read it to you. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, please. <laughs> awesome. Listeners. RWNU white supremacist terrorist. Yeah. Today, the man Ugh. shot and killed 10 people at a grocery store in Buffalo, New York. He is a self-described white supremacist anti-Semite who published a manifesto parroting racist Fox News propaganda. Police believe... He targeted black people, and 11 of the 13 people he shot were black. He is not Muslim. He is not ISIS. He is not an immigrant. He is not BLM or Antifa. He is just another homegrown terror terrorist inspired by bigotry. America, we have a problem a wall won't fix. Yeah, of course. I mean, look. What's, 
unbelievable is that an 18 year old is so full of hate well why is he slow you know why yeah. why is he because his parents are i think his well, parents I'm, bought I'm, him the ammunition right i mean I'm, it just don't I don't, even i don't know them but somehow we have to stop raising children who hate that's not normal no it's not normal. i mean i mean remember the columbine uh killer he he didn't have parents like that i mean not every yeah, bad okay. boy has bad parents and not every good boy has good parents i mean you're yeah right. you're right that's true but you know in tying in um the mental health we were talking about mental health a lot this week for a lot of right. reasons but you know this this kid it's not it's not a mental health reason. It's just like you're a horrible person reason, right? I don't think that's a mental health well, issue. Full of hate, no. and I don't, a, and I don't know why, and I don't. Mentally wrong with a, uh, somebody at 18 that wants to go shoot blacks and Jews, and I, I mean it's, it's pathetic. Just, but how did those parents? How did those parents not know they were raising such a monster? How did they not pay attention? They might be monsters. Who you knows know? what they're like at home today? We're talking to Claire Holt, who I have a personal love for, aside from the world of being in love with her. She lived with me for a short while, but long enough for me to pretend like I was her mother. I feel like already just from the week that we've learned about her and been talking about her so much, I feel like she's my new best friend. <laughs> like, I love her so much already and can't wait she's, to talk to her. She is one of those women, young women, that you want to be your best friend. Yeah. And men want to marry her. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, I want to marry know. her too, in a way. Yeah, I've, I've got a crush. I yeah. definitely she's have a crush. She's so great. Girl crush. I get Girl it. Crush. Yeah, I can't yeah. yeah. not love her. You may know Claire Holt from her starring role in the hit Australian series H2O, Just Add Water, because every young girl at the time watch this show or you may know her from her starring roles in vampire diaries the originals legacies or aquarius with an uh somebody that was our podcast guest david Duchovny. he was the star of that show and she was a co-star claire has in recent years become a beauty brand investor a wife a mother of two amazingly beautiful adorable children and her future keeps getting brighter and brighter I'm so happy to introduce to you my friend and my pretend daughter, Claire Holt. <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> so um, it's a live that's edit. Wild, so you can see it all. Okay, so yeah, where am so I going? You're, you're good. Perfect. You're perfect. You're, you're perfect. Good. Okay. Am and I perfect? Yeah, you're perfect. You're perfect. Okay. Everybody, right now, okay. everybody is perfect. That's what, okay. I won't move a muscle unless my son Either. runs in and jumps oh. in the frame. Oh, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's so smart, too. Her son is so smart. I heard right. that. Oh I, know. I, I know. I know. I want to know everything about you. I'm going to be your best friend starting now. I'm ready. Okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> let's go. We, we actually, Once we have a time. We do have a lot to talk to you about, but we realize that the theme in looking at everything that you've done and, or in some of the stuff that we know and read about is that there's the running theme of resilience and perseverance when it yep. comes to you. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. I think that's like the, the recurring theme in my life. Right, because yeah. you as a young, young girl came here mm -hmm. from Australia where you were a big star. You were a big star after H2O just had water. I don't know about big star, but I had at least, ha I was a working actor. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, you came, <laughs> and then you came to the United States, and then what happened? Nada, nothing. <laughs> I, I landed in America and I was like, okay, well I booked my first ever job in Australia so it's going to be that easy in America. I'm just going to land and, you know, Steven Spielberg will pluck me off the street and that'll be that. And that was not the case. <laughs> uh, I think I did 142 auditions, I'm pretty sure is the number, before I got my first job in America. And it was a relentless stream of no. And, you know, thank God for people like Risa, uh, who said, you know, it's a numbers game. You just got to keep showing up and getting close is good enough sometimes. And I also, you know, I felt like I had something to prove, especially to my friends and people back in Australia. I was like, I'm going to Hollywood, I'm gonna make it. And I really didn't wanna to have to go home and, you know, say that it didn't happen for me. So it was, it was really hard. It was hard for a while. Yeah. But you know what, anybody that's an actor has to go through that. 
and they think sure. they're alone. So when they hear For this, sure. right, Amy is an actor, yeah. and she goes through this too. Yeah. And by the way, we still go through, I still go through it. Yeah. All of us who choose this profession for our entire lives face this because, you know, the, the measure just changes. So at first you just want to book something like a guest star or, or, you know, um, a small independent film. And then, you know, as you start to work more, you become more passionate about growing your career and advancing, and then you're competing against different people. And so your entire life, you're always competing against someone and you're always getting told no. Um, and unless maybe you're, you know, nope. Brad Pitt, he's probably not getting told no. <laughs> no, he will get told no. Look, I represent people that have won the Academy Award. They get told right. no a lot. Yeah, that's true. It's just They're a hard business. No. It's a mm -hmm. hard business and it seems very subjective, you know? like Right. And yeah. I think the thing that really helped me um, was learning. It probably took me like five or seven years of constant rejection to learn that it probably wasn't about me and that it probably didn't have anything to do with you know, how hard I had worked or whether I was good enough, you know, there were so many factors at play. And as soon as I started to realize that I kind of would do an audition and then I would walk away and I would let it go. And obviously, like if I really wanted it, I would try and find a way to connect with the director or the writer or producer or someone involved in the project. But you know, even recently, I, something happened and I didn't get the job at the very, very end. And I was like, okay, it wasn't meant to be, you know, it probably wasn't to do with me. Maybe they needed someone from a different location. Maybe I was too tall. Maybe, you know, that someone had a friend involved. There are so many factors and uh, it, it helped me to live a much more peaceful life when I realized Healthy, that. A much healthier life for you Absolutely. when you're able to let it go. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of sure. the world that we live in now, though, is a, a different world than you started in because now yes. it's so much about who has followers on social media. And wait, Ugh. I know we have a lot to talk to you about, but somehow Claire has seven million followers <laughs> on on Instagram. Correct? Am I right? I, and yeah, I do. And I have seven point five. There, seven point five. Sorry, <laughs> there are Let's there throw are, half there are people that charge a lot of money to try to help stars get more followers. But Claire, you did it by yourself. How'd you do that? Yeah, you tell know, us, I, we need to know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was very lucky in that I was on a show that had a great following and I got, you know, plopped into the show in season three. So I was very lucky that it had a built-in fan base and I was able to sort of grab some of those fans and connect with them and then they they supported me on Instagram and Facebook and other sort of social media channels and then as I started to find my voice I think in social media and learn that authenticity is key above everything else and people can see through BS in five seconds and you just have to be yourself and and that will attract audiences or people to your uh your channels that really helped me, I think. And as soon as I stopped um, trying to to put out this image of, you know, every picture had to be perfect and every, it's, a, it's not that I was always that way, but I think now it's so important to show the real you. And I really try not to filter pictures and do, you know, mm -hmm. do too much. Like I definitely don't do any of the face editing apps or anything like that, because I, I think it's like, it sends a kind of harmful message, yeah. Yeah. Um, especially to women. And, you know, I'm a mother, I have a daughter, so it's really important to me, but I really just said, you know what, I'm going to be me. I'm going to say what I say and do what I do. And I'm going to show my life in a way that I think, you know, I still hold on to a little bit of privacy, but I do share a lot of my life. And I think people sort of relate to that and, yeah. and they could, they can tell that I'm not, or at least I'm trying not to be fake. You know, I, I really do try and share who I really am. And um, I think that helps. I think, yeah, I, me too. I think by reading a lot of what you post, you also use a lot of sense of humor. <laughs> yes, always. <Yeah. laughs> I think that like, that's the key to life. You have to be able to laugh at yourself. Yeah. We all and listened to a podcast that you were in that you said you had a little pixie cut all through high school and that the boys oh didn't God. come around. <laughs> so Nothing. No, it didn't touch me. I'd like to they really didn't. find some of those old photos, please. And then when oh, you I've grew, when you grew out them. like more of a bob, then all the boys started to come around. So that's how you developed your sense of humor, which 
I love. It truly, I didn't know what was going on. I was like, well, you know, it's, it's all of a sudden this guy's asked for my number and this person, like no one's ever looked twice at me. And you know, I'm 17 at this point or 16. It's not like it's like yeah. 13. So I really had to develop other sides of my personality to make sure that, you know, I could <laughs> get on with guys or women or anyone. Um, you know, looks was never really one of the things that drew people to me, that's for sure. That's so funny. And, Can't and- believe my mom did that to me. What? Hey, she cut your she hair like that? Oh yeah. That I wanted it. She says to me, "You wanted it," and I absolutely. There's no way that I would have been like, you know what? Cut it all off. <laughs> See, I I identify with that so much because I have really curly hair, and I had bangs like a shorter, like a mullet, <laughs> and then like a short. I'm like, I did not want that, but I think I I kind of remember asking for it in sixth grade. And then just going with it. And it took a while to, to grow you that gotta out. you got to stick with it. Once you've committed as well, like you can't <laughs> so. just go back. You're like, it was no, bad. this is me. It was bad. <laughs> yeah, it's it certainly wasn't a, I, I wasn't one of those like gorgeous high schoolers winning prom queen or anything. Which that is was kind not of, my story. <laughs> which is kind of weird because we've seen pictures. Oh, I've seen you in person, of course. And you are freaking gorgeous. gorgeous. Oh, thank you. No, it's I, the, yeah. It's the truth. Listen, there's, there's, a, there's some makeup and hair going on no. here right now. And you get more beautiful as you get older mm-hmm. and as oh, you become you. like that mother of those ama- those kids. Oh, I know. How lucky Honestly, is that? I think it's the joy that I have in my life. Yeah. I think that the yeah. people can I see it. I, I, I pinch myself every day. I cannot believe that I get to be the mom to these kids. And, you know, my story, my journey to motherhood was not easy. My I lost my first baby and it was awful and and devastating yeah and and i didn't know that i was ever going to be able to have children so uh when i got my babes i just it just had this entire other level of appreciation for them and as they get older and older they say the funniest shit these kids i cannot get over it all day long they're making me giggle and i just think it's like there's so much happiness that comes from that i feel so lucky and i think that that maybe you know, shows, I don't know. <laughs> but she posts, yeah. You post it in your stories too, some of this stuff that they say. And the fact that you early on you were jealous of your husband because he had a better relationship with your daughter. Oh yeah, she wanted nothing to do with me. The first seven months of her life, she was like, I don't give a shit that you gave up margaritas for s- nine months for me. <laughs> like, get away. I want nothing to do with you. She, I could not get a smile out of her. She didn't want to be held by me. And then like she hit seven or eight months and it flipped thank God. Oh, thank and now God. he's the one like working for it all the time. But <laughs> thank God. It's really funny. Like, and see, he, know, he's, know. what's the point? <laughs> he's an amazing man too. I think because you is. also had difficulty talking about perseverance and resilience. Yep. You had, you got divorced, right? Yep. I did. Yeah. I, I have not, I mean, Andrew is my soulmate for sure. There's no question about it. And it's funny because we met quite quickly after I uh, split from my ex-husband and a lot of people were like, oh, it's too fast and, and you don't really know. And, you know, is this a rebound and maybe you should give it some time. And I think within two weeks or three weeks, we both just knew that yeah. like this was it. How and did you meet? We got set up by a mutual friend in LA and I was having a horrible, awful day. I was devastated still over like what was happening to my life. My life seemed to be falling apart. And my friend was like, can you just come out and have a drink with us? Like, I don't want you to sit home come meet my friend Andrew he's in town he's really fun you'll have a great time and I almost cancelled and I was ready to go and I was dropping something at my sister's house and I was crying outside the front of her house and I was like I'm supposed to go to this drink and I'm having the worst day I don't want to go and I'm just gonna go home and she looked at me and she was like Claire you look gorgeous you've done your hair and makeup you're going (laughs) I was like okay fine (laughs) thank goodness I went and I met him and you know the rest is history yeah See, that's what we were talking about. It takes a lot of strength and a lot of like self awareness. You can't to get out there even when you're feeling badly. Like Yeah, it's funny. My mom has this saying that she always said to me from when I was very young, which is get up, dress up, show up. Mm-hmm. And I I just always said that to myself. Like I can go for one drink, I can go for one coffee, I can show up at this audition. If it doesn't work, I'll be okay. Just just try. Yeah. And so I always just lived by that. I just tried. And, you know, if it didn't work out, that was fine. At least I had a crack. And, and did your mom, so, sorry, go on, sorry. No, 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 that's, that that was sort of what was behind the, the meeting with my husband and many things in my life, moving to America. Did your mom also tell you to wear clean underwear? 
<laughs> yes, she did. Mine she did, did too. <laughs> Get up, dress up, show up, wear clean underwear. <laughs> Every mom says that. <laughs> yep. Now you've gone from being a very successful actor to being a brand entrepreneur. Like you've, you've, there's so many, tell us about some of the uh, brands. The that shifts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. well ABC. first let's talk about the shift from, from, I mean, is there a shift? Because I, I've heard you talk about, oh, I used to be an actress, I am a recovering actress, yeah. these things. So do you feel like that's a different stage in your life? Or are you just taking a minute with the For kids? now, yeah. for now. Yeah. I think that, you know, when I first had my children, I was so insecure about who I was and my identity as a mother, as an actress, as a person. Like I had identified so much of my self-worth of my career for so many years, ever since I moved to America until I had children. I was like, if I book a job, I'm worth something. If I just keep working, I'm worth something. That, you know, no one can ever say I, I'm not doing anything. And so when I had kids, obviously, you know, first of all, no one's hiring a person at seven months pregnant. I'm sorry, but they're just not. And then, you know, in the immediate postpartum period, so much is changing. And I, I just wasn't even able to work, I don't think. I remember doing an audition six weeks after I gave birth from James, uh, gave birth to James, and I was swaying. I was like rocking in the audition because I'd been rocking this baby for <laughs> six weeks straight. And then I like stopped and I tried to get my lines out and I hadn't, it was blank. There was nothing there. My brain was just not working. And I looked at them and I was like, I'm so sorry. I just had a baby, I have to go. And obviously they were lovely about it. Uh, but I realized like, I don't know who I am right now. And I don't know if this is gonna be my future. Obviously my family is the most important thing to me in the world, but I've had this career that has been everything to me for so long. And I didn't, you know, I hadn't achieved what I wanted to yet. And I was still sort of climbing. And, and, and then I wanna say it took me, well, first of all, I slowly came to the realization that, and Risa, you actually really helped me with this. It's funny. She said to me, spend time with your babies. Oh. Be with oh. your babies. Work will always be there, but th this won't. This time, this moment will not be there. And don't think that you have to be, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about this. It was it really powerful. Cry. It makes me yeah. cry, oh. No, really, it was really powerful that you said that to me because I, I thought, you know, I have to get straight back to work and I have to strike whilst the iron's hot and, you know, work begets work. And I need, and, and then I stopped and I was like, no, that's not what life is about. What life is about is experiencing the joy and the love that I'm experiencing right now. And, you know, if someone says, oh, she can't, you know, if I didn't get another job or if I never worked again, it, I had to come to the point where that didn't matter. And so now I sort of, in the past, a year or two, especially with the pandemic, because that sort of changed everything, I started to think, okay, if I weren't to act again, and I hope I do, but if I weren't, what could I do to still feel creatively fulfilled, to still feel like I was flexing those muscles that I really enjoyed flexing and that I was learning and that I wasn't just sitting at home spiraling about how my career went nowhere. And, uh, and so I started to you know, learn about investing and learn about working with brands and you know finance and and design and I, I really started to ask questions of people who were successful in those areas um so i asked questions of uh, venture capitalist friends and um, people who worked in finance and then designers and people who did marketing and i really tried to sort of act as a sponge and soak up as much information as i could and now i've really enjoyed this transition into partnering with brands and, you know, developing collections or investing and, and specifically in female founder brands, um, working, you know, in an advisory capacity with different brands. And it's been really, really wonderful and really fulfilling because I get to be at home with my kids. I wake up with them. You know, I travel sometimes for short periods, but I don't have to go away to Croatia for nine months and like figure out, am I taking them? Am I, am I leaving them behind and flying back and forth? You know, I've really got to work and enjoy myself, but, but really focus on, on my babies and my husband as well. So it's been an awesome Amazing. transition. Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy because in one interview you were talking about how you never <laughs> felt like you were bright enough, smart enough. And <laughs> when you, I hear this, I think you're probably brighter than 95% of the people oh. out there and about what you're, you. how, about how you want to live your life. 
and that you've soaked up all of that information so you could be successful in another area. The smartest people are the people that listen and learn, yeah. not the people that talk. Yeah. So thank you. And I have to say, I had I had my husband's support in that, and he really encouraged me. And I I will always be grateful to him as well because he said, I believe that you can do other things. I know that you thought that your only skill and maybe you weren't even that skilled at it was acting. And I know that you thought that this was the you know everything to you, but you can be more, you can do more, you can learn more, you can, you know, you can switch to a different career. People do it all the time. And he said, I think that you have the brains for it. And I think you have the drive and you should try. Claire, you talk about uh, asking for help, that mm. it's been great for your mental health, not just mm. for what you've been through trying to have children, but just trying to balance your life, uh, having children, having a career, having a husband. Uh, can you talk to women about that and and how important it is to say no to some things and yes to some things and and uh, how you manage to have self-esteem that you obviously, uh, whether you got it through asking for help or you just managed to, uh, uh, how you, you got, got through that with 142 no's? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in, in the early days, I had people like Risa there for me to sort of tell me that it was normal and that I was not the only one who was facing that and that I just had to keep going and that she believed in me. And, you know, I asked actors to help me. I asked for help with auditions. I, I asked people to run lines with me. I, I reached out and, you know, said, I'm struggling with this. Do you know anyone? So it, that was kind of the early part of me learning to ask people for things. And, you know, the, there's this very Australian mentality and I'm sure it's the same in many parts of the world, but, you know, we have to do it on our own. We have to get there right. on our own and, and you can't ask for help and, and you're weak if you ask for help. And I don't think it's necessarily the case anymore, but it definitely historically was the case. And so I didn't, really grow up thinking it was okay to ask people to do things for me. And then as I got older, and especially as I transitioned into motherhood, I had this vision of what it would look like. And I would be breastfeeding my infant, you know, for a year and make six months minimum, but that, you know, a year was my goal and that I wouldn't really need that much help. I certainly wouldn't need full-time help until I went back to work. But, you know, I would I would be totally fine. And, you know, I've grown up with around kids and blah, blah, blah. And um, it was so not the case to me. I absolutely lost the plot when I had my son. I had severe anxiety. I struggled so much. I felt like I was failing constantly. I felt like a terrible mother that I couldn't feed him properly. I couldn't soothe him properly. I didn't know what his cries meant. I didn't, you know, I really felt like I was failing. And then... Uh, it was a lot of people in my life, again, who stepped in, including my husband, and said, like, you can stop breastfeeding. It's okay to give you baby formula. Or you can, we can get childcare. You don't have to look after him all the time. It's not your responsibility. We can ask for help. Or my mom, she came and lived with us for uh, eight months, actually, when my son was born. She came and she lived with me, and she was an enormous help to me. And at the beginning, I felt like, you know, I should be doing this on my own and I can't believe I need all of these resources. Some women have four kids, five kids, 10 kids. They do it on their own and they don't need the help. And I'm so weak that I have one and I can't even do that. And I think, you know, a big part of me transitioning to, to being okay with asking for help was seeing other women speak out and say, I ask for help. I have help. I don't do this on my own. You know, we lived in communities many years ago. Our grandmothers and all our families lived close and we all helped each other. Like, this is not something that you ever did on your own. And, and it shouldn't be that way if you can, you know, if you have the resources, if you have friends, if you had family, if you can afford childcare. And so that's why I've always been a huge proponent of being open about the fact that I ask for help from therapy to childcare to uh, leaning on friends um, to openly sharing you know, the failures in my life or, or the things that I've faced. Um, because I think when you're vocal about your experiences and you share what you've been through and you share 
what might not seem like the perfect life, it really helps other people open up as well. Mm -hmm. And it helps them feel safe and comfortable asking for help. Yeah, yeah definitely. Which is where I think this is May is um, mental health month, by the way. Yes. I think what you're saying is so huge because I grew up with a mother who had to be superwoman and she wasn't, but she wanted to do everything herself. And I think that it, it may be Australian, but I think a lot of American women are like that too. And For it's sure. really, uh, we, we have great mothers like you. And you said there's women that raise five and 10, but there's also women that, uh, strangle five kids at a time. Or, yeah. you know, I mean, we have a lot of a lot of mental health issues in this country yeah. because women don't ask for help or embarrass yeah. you or, like you said, yeah. have superwoman complex. So, I I just thought that was so huge that you learned that at a pretty young age. Thank you. And I, I think you know the thing that really helped as well was knowing like my kids deserve a happy mom. And they will feel my energy and they will feel yeah. if I'm anxious or stressed, you know, I could even tell with my children when I was feeding them, like they knew that I was struggling with breastfeeding, they're infants and they can, you know, they, their energy would change. And I would be so anxious every time I was working myself up to feed them. And I would be, you know, d so worried that they weren't getting enough. And, and I couldn't enjoy the experience of having a newborn. And as soon as I switched both of my babies to formula, they were more relaxed. And because I was relaxed and, you know, it's funny because a mother told me this at, at um, a baby group that I went to when James was two months old. And to be fair, it was delivered in a mildly condescending way. So I was like, <laughs> you can go F yourself, lady. Like, I'm not listening to you. But she was like, your baby can tell that you're stressed. And, you know, my baby's on formula. My baby's fine. So you should just give your baby formula. Like they, they react off what you're feeling. And I just, it was delivered in a way that probably wasn't palatable to me at that time, but she was right. You know, I, my, as soon as I stopped feeling all of this anxiety and this stress, I felt like my kids relaxed. And so I really tried to use that going forward. And, and the same thing goes for being a working mom, you know, like I'm not giving up my whole life to be a mother because I think that's better for them. I'm happy when I work. I'm happy when I challenge myself. I'm happy when I go away for a few days and, you know, do a couple of days on set or travel for an event or whatever. I come back refreshed. We're all happy. So, you know, I, I, that's not to say that I need to be with them all the time and I gave up my whole career for them because I really didn't. But I just, just think that a happy mom is a happy kid. Yeah. And you're not going to be young forever. So right. it's... The perfect Look, time. I, yeah, well, you're a there role is, model for them, right? So they get to see what it looks like to have a balanced life where you have children and you're working and fulfilling yourself. I think that's a really good way to be I a try good and listen, mom. I mess up all the time. Like, I, I'm certainly not perfect. And I don't want to appear that I, like, have my shit together. To be honest, you know, I was going to talk about this on my Instagram, and I don't know why I didn't, but I'll say it here. The other day, I was doing something for work, and... I pick my son up at 11.45 from his little Montessori. He goes for three hours, 8.45 to 11.45. And I was working, working, working. I didn't look up my phone. I didn't look at my time at the time. It was 11.54. I was, I didn't go and get my son on time. And I lost it. I was like, oh. I forgot I'm a terrible mother. I forgot my son. My three-year-old baby sitting at the window looking out. And you know what I did? I called my friend who has a, my amazing friend who has a son at the same school. And I said, I've really messed up. I didn't look at the time. I've been working. Do you think you could get James? I know you're probably, and she was like, no problem. I'm in the parking lot. Like she went and got him. She brought him home. And I went, okay, I can either beat myself up for a week about the fact that I messed up and I didn't pick my kid up and I'm a terrible mother, or I can be grateful for the fact that I have this amazing friend and I asked for help and she was there and she picked up my son and he was happy and none the wiser. And you know, like we move on. So yeah. it, we, I definitely mess up and I know that like we all do, but I think it's about reframing those failures into like learning experiences or, or ways to be grateful. He's going to know when he listens to this podcast. He's yeah. going to know. He's yeah. going to know. <laughs> he did. He said to me this morning, because I said to him, I was like, I'm so sorry, love. I was really busy, but Miss Ashley came and picked you up, whatever. This morning, he goes, are you going to be busy today, mom? Oh. <laughs> but you know what? I'm sure, I'm sure it was a positive for him. He got to be with his friend a little longer. Oh, by the way, longer. sometimes they yeah, want, it's a positive. They, sometimes maybe he wanted to be picked up by somebody else. That's yeah. true. He did yeah, say totally. when he got out of the car, he said, I love when Miss Ashley picks me up. See? Oh, oh, God. Oh. Oh. And then you feel sad I'm because. Sure 
sure then you're I'm jealous. Gonna be for, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be paying for his therapy. I'm sure. Of course. That's going to come up in uh, 2020. Just add anyway. it to the list, oh, right? <laughs> yeah. No, but I. So the reason why I gave you that advice was because I did have to work 24 yeah. seven almost. And I, I remember. look back and I think my son is now 27. Miles is 27 years old. And yeah. I lost all of that time. I mean, no. I, I wish that I was there more. So, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side, right? For sure. Yeah. Oh, you got you a great kid. Great advice, Risa. I think you gave, you know, be oh, yeah. with your with your babies now. Yeah, if you can give it. Because yeah. you remember, like, Indians on a reservation, they put the old Indian in the teepee where all the younger ones would go to get <laughs> advice and hear stories. Right. Because that one had already been through so much. So they could help yeah. guide the younger ones. That's me, I'm the right. old Indian. Listen, it all takes, <laughs> that's the saying, right? It takes a village and it does. Sure. It doesn't, who knows where your village comes from if it's your mom staying with you or all of your friends, but it takes a lot of people to There is something that I want to say, but poor Gloria, who is obsessed with you doing Formula One. <laughs> obsessed. Oh, no, you go. No, I, I am obsessed with Formula One too. I'm patient, you go. No, no, uh, this was just a tiny story, but I was on the phone with Bruce Cohen the other day. Bruce Cohen won the Academy Award for American Beauty, and he's a great producer, and he was talking about because I had he somehow was talking about Miles, and he said, "Well, I haven't." I said, "You haven't seen him since he was a baby." He said, "No, I went to a dinner party at your house, and then I remember it was the dinner party with you, Rafi, Ed Westwick, Melanie, Rafi, Quinn, was a, Culpepper, right? I was think that's true. Well? I think that's true. Yep. Yeah, Bruce, me, Miles was there. Remember, Rafi was not at his I, best. He was actually. A legend because he, that was the first person I met when I moved to America. When I came to America, I didn't know anyone. Like I didn't have a friend. I came with one suitcase, and I, it just was completely naive. And he was awesome because he drove me around and showed Aww. me the ropes, and you know, made me feel like, okay, you can have a life here, and you'll be able to figure it out. And you know, we all do it, and just lean on, you know, another asking for help. Right. He helped me. That's so good. Oh, See? nice. That's nice. That's a nice story. That yeah. is a nice story. It yeah. <laughs> ended well. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it ended well. Thank God. I'm still friends with that. I'm friends with most of my exes. I love that. I'm not. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah, I said most. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Gloria. All right, Gloria, go. Okay, go. I just want to hear about your Formula One experience. Let's do it. I am obsessed with Formula One. So I... Many years ago, if you'd have asked me this, I would have been like, Formula One, you're yeah, right. Like, look at their race by, you can't even see them. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, like everyone else on planet Earth, I watched the Netflix documentary, Drive to Survive, yeah. and became like an obsessive fan of Formula One. Like, the drama, the cars, everything about it. It's just magical, that, that docuseries, I think. Of anybody in particular, yeah. or just the race aspect of it? Because it's very different how they race. I live in England part. I live in England part time, so I so I'm quite familiar with it. So you know all about it. So the the race aspect, of course, and I really loved uh, Daniel Ricciardo because he's Australian, and then Alex Albon, who actually is a, uh, a driver for Williams, who I'm working with right now. But I just all of them. First of all, they're smoking hot. Like everyone. I'm a Lewis Hamilton fan. I do like. Yeah, Lewis I love Hamilton. Lewis as well. He and he's the he's the goat. He's the goat yes, of racing. Yes, he is. He um, is. But, you know, it's just, it's such a great sport and the energy is so fun. And, and it's not something that I, you know, 10 years ago had ever envisioned being super passionate about. And then, you know, I posted about loving it on my Instagram and uh, Williams reached out to me and said, like, oh. do you want to come to a race? Do you want to, you know, do you want to join the family? And and it was epic. I, I got to sit in the car. I got to, like, oh my do, gosh. it was so great. The first time ever, my brother thought I was cool. Oh. So that was like huge for me. That's worth it. Yeah, that's good. How that's fun funny. is that? That's hard fun. So where did, yeah. where did they race there? I'm just imagining that. In Miami. So they went, uh, it's, it's um, Hard Rock Stadium. So oh, they, they made a racetrack. And I think there were a bunch of issues because it was the first year and it was sweltering. It was like 95 degrees or something crazy. Oh. I don't know how they drove in those conditions. No. Uh, but it was very, very fun. I had a great time. That's cool. That's cool. Nice. I saw the pictures. They were very cool. Yeah, so what do you stop. do? Do you I was do, showing off, gonna, wasn't I? Oh. No, 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 I love it. No, no, that's good. No. They're gonna they're gonna do um a Formula One. I don't know when it is. I keep thinking it's the summer, but I don't maybe not, maybe it's fall in Las Vegas. And I Oh, next quite, year, I think. 
Oh, and I can't quite figure out how they're doing it because they're closing down because it's not a circle. So I just don't get how they do it. I don't know how they're doing it either. I think that's probably because why it's taking so long to to logistically the logistic, figure it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. But it is next Crazy. year. I have to go to that one. I'm going to go to the Austin race. I think. Uh, at, later on this year and hopefully either japan or brazil i don't know which oh, wow one <laughs> nice very nice I'm so excited <laughs> wow yeah. oh yeah i should do that i'm a fan don't i get to do that Put it on your yeah, Instagram. DM you know it's funny that's that's you know part of of what i have really loved about social media is i share what i really love like i genuinely love that show and you get to make these authentic connections with brands and and um and people and it feels real because it is real like i love formula one i had the best so time cool. and i think That's people so... can tell if you're faking it and of i think course. they can tell if you don't act you know these some of these hashtag ad situations or like partnerships right. you can right. tell if someone doesn't actually like it right and so that's always been a thing for me like to really just work with brands and companies that i love and i believe in and i know that sounds cliche but it's the truth i love I your, get it i love your bathing suits those ba the baby yeah, you do? that was fun oh wow that was Those that was really fun <laughs> you know i was i just had l when uh they approached me to sort of do a collaboration and i really loved the the ethos of that company which was like a suit that looks good on everyone you should be as comfortable at the beach as you are anywhere and who's the collaboration with and again I, uh -oh. andy swim andy swim um can, oh, you can hear me? No, yeah. you're good. Oh. You're good. There you go. Okay. And then, um, so I was very early postpartum when I started designing those swimsuits. And I just thought, you know what? I want to design a collection that I would feel comfortable in, that mums would feel comfortable in, that I can run around the beach chasing my toddler, but also feel like sexy and feminine. And, um, you know, I said like at nine months postpartum, I was going to do the, the shoot for it, whatever shape I was in, you know, and I didn't do anything crazy to try and get in shape or anything because I really wanted it to be, okay, this is me, this is my journey. And I, I love to exercise and I eat healthy, but I also indulge and I love more wine and margaritas and all those things. But I thought, okay, this is going to be a great thing for me because I'm going to be vulnerable and I'm going to show who I am. And I'm a mom, I've had two kids and I'm going to try and design a collection for women with children, without children, like anyone to feel comfortable. So it was really fun. You know, at the end of our podcast, which we probably are approaching, we do things called raggeries or kudos. What raggeries are we talk about the things that have driven us crazy this week or like in somebody, general. Like if somebody steals your parking space, that's a raggery. Oh, yeah. Know, like like <laughs> yeah, that kind of raggery. thing. Yeah. And kudos are just giving somebody that's done something amazing, you know, or something that you love. So that's the point that we're going to get to now because we have like 10 minutes sort of left because we don't want right. to keep you all day because I know you have kids. So No, it's perfect. Great. I love that. Yeah. So should we should we do raggeries with Claire? Oh, yes, please. Sure. Okay. Does anybody have any? Why don't you do some examples so she can hear? Gloria, I'm okay, sure you have a raggery. Examples. Yeah. Oh, I've always got raggeries. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I already did my husband being crabby part, so I guess I can't do that again, can I? Yeah, you can. Oh, my husband's really crabby <laughs> lately, today. <laughs> That's my raggery, very simple, very to the point. Well, yeah, yeah. And I get that. Well, that's, yeah. Because his, that's because his feet hurt. His foot, yes, he has fasciitis. It yes, really so. is a thing. Yeah. That's a bad you wouldn't thing. think it was, but it really is a thing, and he's got it. And he saw. I'd be, I'd be crabby. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's crabby. So can I do my kudos at the same time? Sure. Sure. Okay, my kudos is what I'm going to suggest to him to make up for his mood. Yeah. And I don't know how I'm turning that into a kudos because I hadn't really thought about it, but the kudos is going to go to my husband for doing something very nice for me because he's been very crabby. Oh, what's that's he, good. What's he going to do? Yeah. I don't know. I haven't thought of it yet. I'll th I'm going to think of a good one. But he said he would? Like he laid it out like no, that? No, I haven't told him yet. Oh. Oh, I'm going to tell him later. Your kudos is that you're going to demand for him to do something good for Not you. Not demand. I'm just going to remind him how crappy he's been. Oh. And then, um, I like this and psychological so kudos flip. will be, yeah, it'll be him feeling sorry for me. And okay, on we go. Perfect. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to play that pity card. Okay, good. Claire's, hmm. Claire's going to learn from us. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Anybody? I've been married 40 years. I've been married longer than anybody else in the whole world. Never mind the entertainment industry. So. That's and by the way, she's, I love that. she's married to a rock star. 
And they've been married for 40 years. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Crazy. It's amazing. Okay. Anyone? Okay, next. Uh, I have a raggery. Okay. I've been trying to Marie Kondo my closet <laughs> for like a year. <laughs> Me too. Ah! I don't even try anymore. So I have this pile of clothes in the hallway that I'm like, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. I'm just going to throw everything away. That's my decision. Really? I'm just gonna yeah, give it's it to a good people. Decision. No, no. I mean, I don't throw give, anything away. Give I give it. To it. The people yeah, no, that I do. I donate yeah, to yeah. women and children that are from shelters. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So is that a, is that a raggery or a kudos? That's my raggery, but my kudos is that I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Like today, maybe. <laughs> like today, I'm doing it. I love it. that. I just felt like a, whew, I'm doing it. So yeah. Love it. Yeah. Thanks. I don't okay. really have any raggedy. But you know what? what? It seems like we're it seems like we're all being on our best behavior with Claire because okay. normally I have one. Okay. Really okay. Ratty things. Wait, wait, I have one. I have one. You know when okay. when somebody texts you endlessly when there's nothing complaining when there's nothing you can do about it. They're yeah, plane that's with, really their annoying. plane is late. You, they're in Atlanta, you're in Los Angeles. My plane is late and then it's my plane's really delayed. My plan was canceled. And then, like, like you know, it's like. Write your congressman. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I'm nothing sorry. To do about it. And you can't do And there's nothing you can really do about it. And you want to. Nothing. Like, you want to call the airline and tell them, what the fuck are you doing? But anyway, that's my, anyway. That's my raggery. <laughs> <laughs> and is your kudos that you learned how to turn your phone off? No, I did not learn how to turn my phone hmm. off. I'm not one of those people hmm. that says no easily. Sloan, you got anything? Another Same. raggery. Yeah. Well, I've got a couple of kudos. One is, as we're talking about mental health month, is to Winona and Ashley for bringing it to the forefront about Ashley. Yeah. I mean, about their about mother, the Naomi. Naomi. Mm -hmm. And uh, also a big kudos, I think, to Claire for really teaching women in their 20s and 30s to ask for help. I mean, I... I listened yeah. to some of your yeah. other podcasts and I thought, wow, for a young, a young woman, a young mother, uh, Hollywood uh, actress, she's really got her shit together at a young age. Uh, Thank and you. That was fun. And I, no, I was really, really impressed with who you are. Not the actress part, which obviously you're amazing, but the person part of uh, Thank you. what you're saying. You obviously are appealing to seven and a half million people, but it, there's a reason for it. You're authentic and and leading a really healthy life. And I think it's amazing coming over to a country knowing nobody. No kidding. And uh, creating the life you have. I mean, I really am impressed. I'm gonna change my kudos. Yep. I'm changing my kudos. Okay, go ahead. To Claire, to Claire coming over oh. from Australia <laughs> on her own. Yeah. Who does that? Like, how can you? you. Oh, I by the way, young, 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 young and naive. Courageous. Young and naive. Young and courageous. I always think I'm so ballsy, and I couldn't do that. I could go to lunch by myself. I could go to a movie by myself. I could spend I'm a night sure in house you by myself. I'm sure you could have been at 20. I don't think I could do it now either. If you said to me, like, pack up, you're going to... France to live. But you know what? But you know what? Maybe. <laughs> Except when my husband, not to go back to him again, but when he dragged me to England at 23, I thought I was going to die. Do you and know? You did it. But you did I did it. it. And they didn't even have mayonnaise in England back then. Mayonnaise? Oh, figure. God. Yeah. <laughs> I find that to be maybe a positive. I it don't was know. so different. No, it was just different. It was very. It, it's very like now it, yeah. yeah, like now it's very Americanized. But back then, 112 years ago, it was really different. Yeah. It was yeah. okay. That's so, it's a big thing. You did it. Let's see mm -hmm. if Claire has a raggery. You have any? What's my raggery? Oh my! Uh, my son told me that he didn't love me. He only loved his dad. That's oh, my shit. Raggery. Oh. <laughs> when did he oh, say that? Right. Every day it changes. He he. I think a couple of days ago, he was like. I kept saying, I love you. He goes, I love my dad. I don't love you. I love oh. my dad. And then oh. it's fine. You know, I know it means he's just playing. And then, uh, <laughs> and then my kudos yesterday, my kids had two birthday parties. So they were entertained all day. It was perfect. I didn't have to like think about what to do with them. So all we have to say is 
Thank you so much for being here thank with you, us. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, Claire. It was so good to meet you. I love you for having me. Love, love. anytime you want me, I'm here. <laughs> Oh no, we'll be back for part two. Great, right, we'll do part two. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm ready. Right. I'm just going to join the you. gang. Oh, we'd love it. It's yes. going to be rags plus C. Yeah, right. crags. crags. It'll be crags. crags. Welcome to yeah. On the Crags. Well, <laughs> crags, perfect. All right. Oh, thank Bye, you. Guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.